Rivers Salgado, as you know, we're doing these personal profiles of the candidates, and we ask them to choose a location that they think reflects them, uh, is important to them, uh, kind of shares some into sight, insight into their background. Tell us why you chose this location for them. Well, I have been serving as a minister of this city for 24 years, and especially, especially in this neighborhood, Benson, for the last 15 years. I spend most of my time in this place, so I believe it's, it is a special place for me to be. Your candidacy has been described as a long shot candidacy. Fundraising is a challenge for you. Tell us why you wanted to run for mayor. Well, to be, uh, be quite honest, I have spent most of my life serving the most vulnerable one in Brooklyn, in New York City. And actually, after Superstone Sandy, we had to go ourselves to hold the different community around the aftermath of Sandy especially in Brooklyn and, and Far Rockaway and Staten Island. And uh, especially when I heard uh, the current mayor saying that everything was okay, that we was not hit as bad, that everything was normal, he was ready to close the only link that the more, more of 500,000 New Yorkers had to actually uh, uh, come to the city. And that very same day, first of all, we were still fishing for body on that very same bridge that he was trying to close for a marathon. And that very same, same day I went to Coney Island and I found more than 40 people hunting for food in the garbage. That really touched me. And I have many people from the Jewish community, the Russian community, asking me to actually run. That was the day I said, enough is enough. These politicians, they are disconnected. Because it was not only the mayor, even uh, the, the, the public advocate saying that everything was okay. And the controller was saying that everything was okay. I don't know if you remember at that time, none of the candidates are currently running for mayor on the Democrat uh, ticket. They weren't even there to, uh, to say anything that might uh, uh, be contrary of what the mayor was saying. So that was the day I decided I had to do something. I had to do more. I had to run. But, you know, some will say, look, this is the mayor of New York City, a sprawling city of nine, you know, nine million people, a big bureaucracy, you have no elected office experience. Why should the voters trust you? They will trust me because, first of all, we have a circus right now. I mean, it's crazy. This election is like you either have to pull down your pants or you have to tweet or you have to go out with a, another woman other than your wife to be or to get some kind of attraction. You have to uh, jump into the police uh, officer and get arrested. But none of those uh, options are a real option for me because if I get myself arrested, I probably will come out after election knowing how we get treated in this city. So um, I, I believe it is important, first of all, for me to represent the Latino community and also represent those people who still believe in conservative value, in, in, in big family structure, and in traditional value. We cannot just look what is going on in the city like we are not part of the city. We assist in the city, we live in the city. We have more than 300,000 Spanish evangelical and we have more than 2.4 million Latino, and I believe it is right for me to be on this way because I'm a Latino representing the Latino community as well. Tell me a little bit about your path to getting here to becoming a minister, where you grew up, your family, give, me, give the voters a little sense of that. Well, I was born in the Bronx. My father came from Puerto Rico, San Puerto Rico in 1926. So he used to tell me everything that, you know, the different stages of the Latino community in the United States, especially in New York City. But I was born with a chronic or childhood asthma, so they had no choice but to take me to Puerto Rico. That's how I ended up with this accent. And then when I was 17, I came back on my own, and I started the first church when I was only 18 years old in this city. And ever since, I have been serving as a public servant, uh, as a minister, but also as a businessman. I opened a chain of bookstore with my wife, Sonia, and I also opened in 2003, one of the, uh, I found, a uh, radio station that become one of the biggest Spanish evangelical radio network. Currently, we have four stations uh, broadcasting in the city, and uh, I was blessed, and I was able to help a lot of people, and that's what motivated me in this campaign, because if I became the mayor of the city of New York, I'm going to be able to hold even more people to that level. You've been candid along the campaign trail talking about your accent, your, your heavy accent. What, what have you said about that? Well, first of all, Al Pacino, they pay him millions of dollars to fake it. I have it for real. That's personal. And besides, everybody has an accent in this city. This is a city that, that everybody has their own accent. The important thing is that people understand my message. And uh, by the end, 
and I, I, I finish fixing this city, everybody's gonna want it. It's gonna want it like the way I did. This has been frustrating for you, this campaign, because of the uh, attention spent on other matters relative to some of the candidates. As well, well it, it is frustrating. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, the post yesterday wrote that, that now we have a, a Latino candidate because we don't have no Latino candidate this race. Now we have one which is Carlos Day. That is insulting because I am a real candidate. I got more than 20,000 New Yorkers who actually endorsed me. And for the post put uh, uh, article like that is very insulting for my community. What are some of the issues that are important to you? Let's explain some. A lot of issues, but especially we have to reform the Department of Education. It is almost, uh, everybody knows that the graduation rates right now went down to 60.4. Most of them are Latino who are dropping out of the school because of financial situation. Uh, most of the kids right now, they have the dropout age with the consent of the parent age of 16 years old. But in the Latino community and in the African American community, we, we believe in big family structure. So when they 16 year old juveniles start to be radical, cutting class, coming late, the first thing that you got is a call from the school saying that you fix your kid that we're gonna open a case with ACS. And parents, they don't want a case with ACS because they have other children as well. So they end up signing the consent and taking that uh, children out of school. And, and, and the, the reality is at the age of 16, you don't think right. You, don't, you cannot get a good job or you cannot get a job, period. And what, you, what are they going to do in the street? So I want to raise the dropout age to the age of 18. And I also want to uh, uh, concentrate in open more vocational, vocational school. The reality is more of the children, some, most, most students that come from minority uh, background, they need to work full time to be able to help their parent with their financial struggle. So if we provide vocational school where they could become either a plumber, electrician man, uh, carpenter, they're gonna be ready for the productive life as soon as they graduate from high school. That's gonna be an incentive for, for them to actually graduate from high school. And at the same time, we're gonna give uh, incentive to the a company and to the union to actually go after this kid that come to the productive life with a good training. We have to concentrate on that and also how I said last night in the forum, we had to concentrate on providing and working with the different community college so they could keep working with program for full time worker. For example, five years ago I went back to Boricua College and I graduated. I was a full time worker and I was a full time student. It was a lot of sacrifice but at least I had the opportunity Although I'm a doctor in theology, but I want to have also a background in early, uh, early child education. And I did finish my, uh, my, my associate and I started my bachelor. So we have to concentrate on that. Many other issues, I don't want to go back to the New York from the 70s. Uh, I want to keep a good law enforcement. What the current administration is doing right now is basically letting the, the police forces go down to 34,000 police officers. So obviously, if the police officer, uh, uh, are, uh, the units are coming down, so they have to keep the city safe. So they put what we call stop and frisk, which is a big net for everyone. But stop and frisk is very uh, controversial. It is not good for the Latino. I was stopped and almost frisk at one time. I said it, and one of the reporters said it was an imaginary cap. It was not imaginary, it was for real. They stopped me, I said, I'm running for mayor. He told me, shut up, go back into your vehicle. Then my assistant over here went over there and said, listen, we, we, we gotta go to a forum. and said, shut up, go back to your vehicle. I, and I was lucky that I was not frisked. But when they stop you and frisk you, people don't understand the way it is. They put you against the wall. They don't care who you are. You could be the pastor, the priest, the rabbi. And if you're in that checkpoint, they definitely gonna stop you and frisk you. And that is unacceptable. And the only reason why they're doing that is because we don't have the amount of police officers that we need in the city. We don't see the big cops anymore in the street with the scooter or the bicycle or the horses. We don't see them anymore. That's the cop, the community policing. That's the cop who know who is the local grocery store owner, who is the local barbershop owner. And we need those cops again in the street so we can keep the city safe like the Giuliani era, but at the same time, treat people with the respect that they deserve, especially the Latino and the African-American who are the ones who are suffering from stop and frisk.
Tell me what you've said about identification for undocumented immigrants and why the New York City mayor should get involved in what is largely federal policy usually. Well, for more than 12 years after 9-11, they took away the license to the undocumented immigrant. And I see a pattern over here. I, I mean, with the African American, they were, uh, the, the, the slavery was abolished, which I don't think was abolished. I think it was substituted. You used to be the African American, now it are the Latino, who they call undocumented, the one who represent the new slave in this new era. Uh, and I believe that they start to make law to prevent them from driving, preventing the Jim Crow law. And that's what is going on right now, because we haven't seen any uh, Mexican, Guatemala uh, doing terrorism in the city. They took away the license, which was the only way for them to identify themselves because it was, according to them then, a uh, potential way to conduct terrorists. And for more than 12 years, they have been completely ignored. And I know to the state level, right now, it's almost impossible because there's a lot of le a state legislators in New, York, in New York State that they don't want any identification for the undocumented immigrant. But I believe we have more than one, mil about a million of them, 900 to a million of them in the city. If we provide a valid municipality identification card, they're going to be able to identify themselves in the city. They will avoid to be arrested by the police in the stop and frisk. But if they get stopped and frisked and they don't have no valid identification, they have to be booked for 24 hours. For, uh, another problem that we see, for instance, in, in Brighton Beach, all the illegal basement were occupied by undocumented immigrants. I either an inspector didn't do his job or he just didn't pass through that area. But the reality, these people, they lost everything. And when the female inspector came to assess the damage, they were not allowed by the landlords because they knew it were illegal basement. So these people, they cannot rent this in apartment on the second floor or first floor because the first thing that they ask you is for a valid identification card. If you don't have it, then you have to try to provide shelter for your family you end up in an illegal place. We have to give these people dignity. I was thrown out from a forum because I say that the horses are gonna keep carrying the carriage, but the people are fighting for their animal rights, which is good. But the undocumented immigrants right now in the city, they have less rights than animals. Because animals, they have medical records, they have names, they have uh, identifications. Uh, and the undocumented immigrants, they have nothing. We, have, we need a mayor who's going to work for all the inhabitants of the city of New York. And I am the only one who's willing to do so. Would the critics argue that they're here illegally and therefore should not be entitled to this? But like Giuliani said, Mayor Giuliani said, they're here and they're going to remain here. The government knows that they're here and they want them here, but they want them here with no right because this is the new slavery, my friend. Slavery had not been abolished, had been substituted. Dr. Martin Luther King, he fight for the right of the African American. And I'm proud for that, but I have to fight for the right of my people because they are enslaving Latino. They are here with no right, and that's what freedom is all about, have right. Without right, you have no freedom. How would you deal with the labor union in the city? I mean, obviously, there are a lot of contracts that are virtually all expired. They are seeking retroactive pay raises. What would you do? Uh, well, I have to, uh, I say, first of all, I have to see why it's on the table. Nobody knows exactly how bad things is. And uh, we have to sit down. One thing I could say, I'm not going to be arrogant. I believe that the current mayor could have closed some of the deals, especially with the school bus drivers uh, strike. He could have done something better, but he don't have that uh, desire to resolve. So I, I could assure that I'm going to be the first one in that room, and I'm going to be the last one to leave. There is a lot of non-functional program in the city. For example, in the Department of Education, they say they don't have money for the bus drivers. And my brother, Johnny in the Bronx, he's a bus driver. He's suffering a lot, so I know how bad it is. They don't have money for the, for the good educator to give me a decent contract. But at the same time, the mayor is spending more than three million per year to provide the money after bill to child of only 13 and 14 years old in the school, not even run by the Department of Education, running by the Department of Health. He's bringing nurses and doctors to our school to give them money after pill without the consent of the parent. So we have to set up straight the priority. For me, in the Department of Education, priority will be the educator. Without educators, we cannot educate. And plan B, gotta go out.
Yes, because that's a very sensitive matter. You could be pro-choice, pro-life, but that's a sensitive matter and it does not belong in our schools. Some viewers will be meeting you the first time with this story. They'll say, does Reverend Salgado really believe he has a chance of winning this race? And if not, why go through it? First of all, I got a chance. We have more than one million Latino in the Democratic Party. That's why I think everybody treats me so nice. And they're all going to come out and vote. If I got my message out, every time I go to a parade, first of all, I walk the Puerto Rican parade three times. Uh, now I'm going to walk the Dominican parade. I went to the Colombia parade. I went to all the parades, and they're all going to vote for me. And that's the reality. If I get my message out, if I get the Jewish community, which I have a lot of support, I got more than 14 rabbis, 28 rabbis who endorsed me, and three of them are my personal consultants. So if I get the Jewish community out, all the unrepresented community, which is like the Pakistani, the Russian, which they help me tremendously in this race, if I get the blessed to get all the unrepresented community and the Latino people to vote for me, and it's a gallo, I'm definitely going to be the next mayor of New York City. And you better believe it. All right, Reverend, uh, we're asking all of the candidates a list of questions that we'll probably put in other stories. Just uh, some of them are one word answers, some of them are just their thoughts. So I want to go through these questions with you. Uh, what has been your best moment on the campaign trail so far? I have a lot of moments, uh, but uh, the kickoff was something tremendous for us. We have so many people coming from different ethnic, Russian, Jewish, uh, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, coming from all over. And we was in City Hall. That was a great moment for my campaign. Worst moment, disappointment so far on the campaign. Every time, every time they exclude me from a poll, every time they exclude me from a forum, it is a very frustrating because I, I believe that we have to be fair in this city. Okay. Uh, favorite sports team? The next. Very disappointed because I always believe they're going to win, and they, at the end they let me down with the next. Not the Brooklyn. You're in Brooklyn, not the Brooklyn. And the Brooklyn, I, I like them. You know, I like them. I wish them. I mean, I mean it's all right. I just wanted to clarify. Okay. Uh, favorite restaurant? My favorite restaurant is the one across the street, Giraffe. I eat there almost every day. What's the name of it? Giraffe. Giraffe. Okay. What do you think the biggest misconception is about it? What do you think people are wrong about it? Well, people might think that I'm a, a hater or I'm against any particular community because I have a conservative value, but that's not the truth. I never had discriminated. So that's the first of all, I have been the one discriminated all my life, so I don't believe in discrimination. Uh, I do have my, my, my conservative view, but I believe that I'm going to be a firm mayor for everyone in the city. What's your biggest pet peeve about New York City? Uh, I'm sorry. The, the biggest thing that annoys you about New York City? Well, the tickets. They, that they really have, yeah, parking ticket, all kind of ticket. I believe that the city actually is targeting the citizen, and sometimes it kind of reminds me of the medieval era when the king sent the, 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 the tax collector to, to hunt the people and to squeeze them away. I believe that ticketing is a, a way for the uh, city right now over ticket the citizen and abuse the citizen. I believe that we have to eliminate all quota, quotas from the ticketing system. If you get a ticket, it's because you violate the law, not because they have to provide a quota to their superior. And it's a shame because some of the time they tell you, oh, I know you're right, but I have to write this ticket. And that's the way it is. Everybody knows it is that way. And many people just had enough. And that's something that really bothers me as well. How would you as mayor prepare for another superstorm like this? Oh, I, I am the only one who have the long-term plan. I was raised in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, everybody know what to do. They have a plan. This city, the current administration, they didn't have no plan, and they're not getting ready for another super storm. What we, want, we would like to concentrate is in uh, giving sentiment to the private market to actually come to our shores, which we have plenty of land for them to come out and build, build and resilient to another super storm. And at the same time, we're going to provide more housing for all New Yorkers, and they will have to provide 30% of those housing units to affordable housing. The reality is there are all these other candidates talking about how they're going to provide so many units, but the city does, have, does not have the money. And others say they're going to seek for further funding. 
they better cross their finger because the federal uh, government right now is going also to their own problem. So we have to stimulate the private market to come out to our shore, build buildings resilient to another superstar. That's why in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean, you have all those big buildings in the shore. It is for a reason, because they are protecting the city, they are protecting the island. And by the end, I finish fixing the city, I'm going to make the shore of New York City look as beautiful as the shore of Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, or Jamaica. What do you think your biggest obstacle is to winning the election? My bigger obstacle is uh, uh, raising more money. If I am lucky to raise more money and get the message across, I'm definitely going to be the next mayor. Do you agree or disagree with the mayor's efforts to try to ban sugary drinks? That, that's, that's, you know, the thing is that the mayor, he do not understand how other people think. Why people drink soda? First of all, when you are in a big family like I am, I have six children. When I go to a restaurant to eat, uh, we don't buy small soda. Because it's not the cost of the food that kills you. It's the cost of the drink. We buy three soda and we share. I know the, the mayor Bloomberg property, he hasn't shared a soda in his entire life. But other people do. And besides, what's the same? If I don't buy the big soda, then I'm gonna have to buy my son five little soda. Because if he says he's still sturdy, what I'm gonna do? Say no? What about the argument that obesity and we have is an issue, particularly in communities of color, which is one of the points that he's trying well, to make? Well, first of all, it's the responsibility of everyone, and through the doctor, to keep the diet. To have a mayor mandating and acting like a king instead of a mayor, that is unacceptable. I said it once, I said it again, what's going to be next, the chicken wing? There's a lot of things that we are eating that cause diabetes, and we cannot have the mayor controlling that, because uh, we need to be responsible, but we have to concentrate, we have to concentrate in uh, 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 physical activity. Therefore, under my administration, no teacher will be allowed to punish any student by preventing to exercise into the recess. Visa is going to be mandatory through my administration. Everybody has to concentrate more in the physical uh, uh, exercise. What is a question that you think your opponents are not answering or sidestepping? Well, uh, there's a lot of questions that they dodge. Um, What's the biggest one you think? Uh, when it comes to social issues, they all try to get the dance around. They, they, they're not specific of what they believe, what they don't believe. They come to the churches lying to people, saying that they are for everyone, but they're not really saying uh, that they actually were the one who bans uh, churches or relig religious organizations from renting school. Actually, I was renting a school to help the community, and I was throwing out. And I believe that was a mistake, although they fixed it after, but they still give it the wrong around, the wrong around, the dance around. Even for super to get access to those public schools to show to people it was almost impossible. And the reality is all these politicians, they are part of the current administration. They are accusing Mayor Bloomberg of doing this and that, but they're not admitting that they are part of the current problems. What do you like to do on the weekend? On the weekends? I love to go to church on the weekends. That's something for sure. And I do full pantry. You and a lot of parade now that I'm in this campaign. Yeah, that, that may be a fair question for you as a minister. What do you do to relax then on your days off? Like, on the day off, I, I, I'll be quite honest. I haven't seen a day off in a while. I work seven days a week. During the campaign, okay. You During mean, the campaign or before the campaign? Before the campaign, okay. Uh, of the last three mayors, Dinkins, Giuliani, and Bloomberg, who do you consider to have been the best? Giuliani. Why? Why? Because Giuliani, first of all, I'm, uh, I, when I saw that he didn't care about going after his own race, that gave me a lot of respect. He didn't care if you were a criminal before he was mayor, I'm talking about. He was, he, pers he prosecuted anyone without uh, the race background. But what about as mayor? Because it was as tension. Yeah, yeah. You know? As mayor, I respect him because uh, the city was, it was all, all, almost impossible to live in this city without, without either being mugged or being uh, assaulted in the street before him and he put, he restored the law and the order in the city. 
Will you or won't you live in Gracie Mansion if you are elected? Oh, I definitely with my six children. You better count on that. Or, or, not, or else I have to commute from Staten Island. That's not fair for me. What do you think your most innovative or impactful idea is for the city? It's the uh, municipality identification card for the more than 900,000 undocumented immigrants. I saw that Bill de Blasio endorsed this uh, uh, idea. He was talking about it. He didn't even give me credit. And I remember in one photo, I told Christine Queen, he's copying my idea. And she said, I would do so as well. And now she endorsed my idea as well. I think you've answered these, but for this, what would you do to make New York City more affordable? Yeah, well, we will have to concentrate in uh, stimulate the private market, the private sector to actually build buildings in our shore. Uh, we will provide them the land, they will build, they will provide the money to build, but they will have to provide 30% of those units for affordable housing, especially for the Sandy victims. Plans to keep the city safe, policy on crime? Well, I'm going to be tough, you know, I believe that everybody deserves to be safe and to feel safe. Therefore, I want to increase the police force back to 37,000 police officers. I want to make sure that all the police officers understand the sociology dilemma of the city, that we do not have a melting pot anymore, we have a collection of different communities, and we want to make sure that they understand the different community that they are serving. We have among the Latinos, for example, we have the demographic and the sub-demographic the same way with the Asian, uh, the, the Asian uh, American. Uh, we have also among the African American, the Caribbean. And we have to make sure that the police officers, they understand the different uh, ethnics that they are serving in this city. Therefore, I'm going to include for all police officers to understand better the sociologically dilemma that we have in New York City right now. Your policy on stop and frisk? Stop and frisk had to stop. It has to go. We have to concentrate and keep the city safe by increasing the, police, the amount of police officers, by sending more uh, community policing and concentrate in going with the community policing on the different community of New York City. Will you give retroactive raises if elected and how would you pay for it? Well, once, a, once again, you know, we have, I, it won't be, be fair for the city or for the union for me to say something like that right now. I have to sit down and see what's going on. Uh, and, and, and if I can, yes, I will. That will be my desire, but I really have to sit down and see what we have in the city right now. What are your plans to improve New York City schools? Well, I want to give back, back, back part of the power to the people. I want to empower the community educational council. I would like for them to have 50% appointed by the mayor, 50% elected by the community, because, and I have to say again, the different uh, uh, school district, they have different needs. New York City is not a mountain bar anymore. New York City is a collection of community, and what could be good and functionable for one school district, it could be not for another one. So I want to empower them any, uh, more and make sure that they have the, the power to decide what school is going to close, what school is going to stay open. As an example, I would also would like to include in the teacher evaluation, the parents evaluation. Who knows better than the parents? Right now they depend on the state, state tax, uh, state test, and also on the principal. But I would like to include the parent in that evaluation because we know better than the parents how the children are improving in their education. So I want to involve more the parents and I want to give part of the power back to the people. And also in the PEP, the uh, Public Educational Panel, I would like to add, uh, to add three independent uh, 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 members elected by the community. So that way the community is involved. We cannot have a king running the Department of Education that's basically what we have. Not a major king for the last 12 years. We don't need another king or a queen for that say in this upcoming election. Father Reverend Salgado, we uh, ask each of the candidates to give us one word to describe the others running in the race. One word, so I'll go. Joe Loden. <laughs> you want me to? Well, Joe Loda, uh, I will say uh, 
Uh, one word, Verrazano. Verrazano? Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> the Verrazano Bridge, that, that, that means he's means. the one. Oh. <laughs> when you talk about the Verrazano Bridge, Joe Loda's name is all over. He's the one who raised the Verrazano uh, Bridge tall, and now he want to be the mayor. He, he could extend the art train. Right now, we have more than six, $600 million surplus to the Verrazano, which is paid for the subway. And yet, the people from Staten Island, they don't have, a, they don't have access to the subway. I was in a forum, and I say, I would like to extend the art train across the Verrazano, so I could, uh, I, the people from Staten Island actually could benefit from the great subway system that we have. And he endorsed that. The, the idea in that photo, and the next day in the advance, they gave him credit for the idea. But meanwhile, what he did for the people of Staten Island when he was controlling the MTA or was president of the MTA? Christine Queen. Christine Queen. One word? Bloopers. She's the continuation of the Bloomberg administration. Anthony Weiner. <laughs> Twitter. Bill de Blasio. Anger. John Lou. John Lou is a decent guy. Bill Thompson. He's a decent guy too. Adolfo Carrion. Adolfo Carrion. <laughs> I have nothing to say about Adolfo. One word. One word. Paisan. Paisan. <laughs> you, like you want to explain that? That means a certain brotherhood of people you may not know it. Kinship, is exactly. that it? Exactly. Sal Albanese. Funny guy. John Katsimatidis. A rich guy. George McDonald. A generous guy. Eric Salgado. And the mayor for all the people, all the inhabitants of New York City. So the one word is what? Mayor? Mayor. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.